Hello everyone and welcome to my first attempt to construct the International Space Station realistically-ish in Kerbal Space Program. This is Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3 because this is the place where I was able to get all the pieces together. There are a lot of mods involved of course and uh, some of them have not been updated in a while like the actual community ISS mod. So I had to do some tweaking to things and that has taken quite a long time. Here we see the Proton Rocket, Proton K specifically, launching the Zarya module and they are a proper hot start to the second stage and separation of the first stage. So this was launched in 1998, November 20th and actually I've got curb alarm clock and we actually time warped to the right date. Um, not that it particularly matters but um, we, we were on the correct date. Just, just taking credit for that. A lot of other things are going to go quite wrong though. So, just a warning ahead of time, and uh, we will see those things. Uh, yep, uh, lots of practice still necessary. Obviously, this is running on a KOS script, so that's why I don't have the UI up. I wanted to get the cinematic version, uh, though I, uh, it won't be without the UI the whole way. We will have to do docking and all that stuff manually. I don't have a script for that. So here we go with the third stage, oh so hot staged. And yeah, the total mass of Zarya is 19.3 tons. It's actually a little bit heavier here. I think I uh, some part or another is a little bit too heavy. Um, only a tiny bit, it's like 0.05 tons. But the net result is that we're right at the limit of pr what Proton can do. And we'll probably be at the limit again with Zvezda. And so... Basically, by the time Proton gets this to orbit, it has no Delta V left. Well, I think we might be able to see exactly how much Delta V it has. There you go, uh, 31 meters per second left. So yeah, not much. Um, okay, so this was a problem. I actually had to resize the Zarya module because it was too big. But uh, it was actually clipping into the Proton. But even after resizing it... It still had this issue with catching on the thing. I think it had to do with the bottom node. Not sure. Anyway, the old time warp trick worked to free it from the third stage. And we proceeded to extend the solar panels and everything looked to be set. So, this is the easy part. Getting Zarya up. Um, next is the space shuttle. So, this is the space shuttle Endeavor on STS-88. And this is carrying the Unity module with PMA-1 and PMA-2. PMA stands for Pressurized Mating Adapter. And they adapted between the common berthing mechanisms, which are on the American modules themselves, and the APAS system, which was used by previously by Apollo Soyuz, and then was updated a bit for Buran and uh, was used on Mir and was ultimately used on the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle docking port was an APAS system. So uh, those docking ports are the ones that the shuttle can dock on. The APAS system is androgynous, but the Russian modules, they have a probe and drogue system, which you might have seen on the Soyuz in progress. They have the probe on them, and the station itself has the drogue ports. Here the shuttle is getting close to the SRB separation point. And actually for most of the missions to the ISS, the shuttle actually had a lighter external tank than I have here. This is somewhere between the lightweight and super lightweight tank. Uh, we probably need to lighten its weight up so that it matches the super lightweight mass. Um, it's, it's a bit tight, uh, even carrying just the 11.6 tons for Unity. And one reason it's tight is because I didn't quite trust Canadarm. Uh, our Canadarm looks good. But it functions a little bit wobbly, especially when carrying something like the Unity module. It is pretty heavy after all. Well, I mean, in space it doesn't have weight, but the mass produces momentum and everything. So, anyway, inertia. So, yeah, I decided to add a little bit of a tug. And so we have a tug in the bay that's based on a tug that was supposed to be used for Skylab. Um, it's called the Teleoperator Retrieval System. This was recommended by Raider Nick as a possibility. The Teleoperator tele Retrieval System, TRS, was supposed to be launched by the shuttle and then grab on to Skylab and boost Skylab back up. Of course, that didn't happen. Skylab deorbited before the shuttle was ready to fly, so that mission never happened. But 
we, we basically have one of these TRSs a little bit modified in the Space Shuttle Bay to help us dock the, dock the modules because I didn't trust Canadarm. We might try and give a more customized Canadarm a try later on, but this is one of the deviations. We'll have many deviations from what really happened, but I'll try and explain them and the reason for them. So, and some of them will just be outright mistakes. So the shuttle is carrying more than it should right now, and that's leading to really tight delta V margins. Normally I would like to reserve 400 meters per second to bring the shuttle back, and we're not looking like we can get that. So I try to have uh, Zarya do some of the maneuvering to rendezvous, and here you see it's got a closest approach distance of about one kilometer, and still 61 meters per second left, but as it tries to help with the velocity matching, it's depleting a lot of its fuel. This was all done during live streams, by the way, and so the music you might notice is a bit choppy, and that's because that's the music that was on while I was doing the stuff, and it's not music that was added after the fact. So, yeah. But still, hopefully atmospheric. Uh, Skyrim music, Oblivion music, and um, I think some Stellaris music was what I used. Okay, so here we go. You can see the TRS uh, tug there, and it just uses hydrazine, and it's pulling the... I, I really should maybe change it. We, we might upgrade the tug. The, the original tug was supposed to use hydrazine. Um, but I might reconsider and give it the same fuel as the shuttle. And that will simplify a lot of things. And it'll also make it lighter. So here we go. Uh, tugging over to Zarya. But this is a tough docking. First of all, the TRS wasn't supposed to dock stuff. It was just supposed to boost or deorbit things. It would really help with the whole uh, cleaning up stuff uh, in orbit. Well, if, if it had a grapple that could grapple on to anything, like the claw, for instance. But because it's on the tail and it's so light compared to the Unity module, it's very hard to maneuver the Unity module at all. And um, yeah, there's, there's no RCS port on the Unity module, so that's the problem. The ability to translate the module is very difficult, so you really have to line it up just right, and um, you have very little opportunity. You can rotate. Rotating is easy. In fact, every, every translation attempt causes a rotation, but actually translating it in any direction except for forward is very hard. So you see here me tentatively trying to get this right. I also wanted to get the rotation right, which was another complication. Uh, it's definitely not looking proper, does it? We may have to pull it off and redock it. That's going to be interesting. That's going to be interesting. And uh, we'll, we'll find out why close to the end. This direction doesn't look too bad. It sort of depends on how you're looking at it. It looks uh, that you can see by the common berthing mechanisms, that's the big docking ports. It looks a bit askew. Okay, be careful now. Again, the docking ports in Realism Overhaul do not have magnetism to speak of. So it's a little bit difficult. And of course, there's no reaction wheel here. I don't think Zarya had a reaction wheel in this case, or at least it didn't feel like it. Unity definitely doesn't have a reaction wheel. The tug does. Tug has a tiny little reaction wheel, but it's like a 0.5 torque. And connection. And boy was that a relief. That took a lot longer than it seems. Yeah, that was uh, that was a bit of tediousness. I also noted that this docking port was mis uh, sort of slid to the side there. I'm hoping it's not an indicator of later issues, but we'll pass on that for now. The tug has to go back into the shuttle cargo bay. We do want to reuse that. It's an added mass and it'll cause trouble on re-entry. We'll dump its hydrazine fuel before coming back though. 
So uh, at least we'll save that mass. Now with more balanced RCS, since we're not tugging the Unity module, it's much easier to maneuver our little TRS system. Oh, it's actually teleoperator retrieval system. So just TRS. It is a cute thing, and that's why I thought it'd be nice to try and use it. And at least it worked. But uh, I should give Canada Arm another try, and try to get a different robotic arm if it doesn't work. Still, even though the tug is nimble, you have to be careful about these things. You don't want to cause a mishap. And... There we go. There was a little bit of magnetism there. I saw a little bit of magnetism. Okay, so now to bring the shuttle back. Uh, here we've done our retro burn, and we've only got 183 meters per second left. Uh, the thing is, it seems to need a lot more RCS to hold the 40 degree pitch up orientation than the shuttle strictly should. Now, during actual shuttle missions, they were very careful about where the center of mass was and making sure to shift the center of mass to the right location for re-entry. Um, they had lead ballast. And I always wonder exactly how much lead ballast was actually carried by the shuttle up in order to make sure its center of mass was alright. But I don't know. You can see here that KOS is controlling the vehicle and that's a good thing because when I'm trying to re-enter, I tend to overcorrect. Like if I think it's um, it's falling short, I'll try and make it go long, you know, pitch down to try and add more lift. But I tend to overdo that, and it'll it'll turn out that we're going to see that because here I'm trying to empty out the excess supplies, if you will, to get some more delta V, and in the process, unfortunately, ship manifest gets stuck making that noise and I go back to Space Center in order to get rid of the noise for the sake of my audience and the KOS script is no longer running and it can't really pick up in the middle I need to write in some way for it to do that but it can't do that right now so I have to control it uh, with the help of Smart ASS eventually I found out that we're way far north so not only did we have that problem but we also had a timing issue I probably should have gotten into a different standby orbit before trying to bring it back down uh, to make sure that we would be lined up with Cape Canaveral. Here we are clearly not lined up with Cape Canaveral at this point. So we're, we're going to be headed over Georgia. I'm trying to turn the shuttle to make use of its cross range, but it's difficult. Especially since I don't want to overuse the RCS, which we don't have too much of. So here we go. Uh, now Smart ASS is active. We've got a 35 degree roll angle, but it is uh, over Mexico. Very bumpy terrain there, but it's it's already probably not a good situation. Uh, you can see from the gray line what our path would have been, and then our blue line is what it is now after doing this turn. It's clearly not enough, and here I am at 45 degree roll, but it's it's too late. We're uh, uh, Florida is in the upper right right now. We are over I think Georgia there. And here I am trying to turn around towards Chesapeake Bay is what you see. We are over the Atlantic and we are going to need to splash down in the Atlantic. Fortunately during my shuttle testing I had some practice bringing the shuttle back down over water. So that, that can be done, turns out. So here we are, descending below 200 meters. Not the return I would have liked for STS-88, especially since this is not how it returned. But as long as the crew is safe, we'll have to take it. We did run out of uh, RCS fuel. So that has to be managed a little bit better as well. I think having the initial launch put us into a somewhat higher orbit than it is right now, it's keeping our periapsis low. Um, for the external, t maybe having the apoapsis higher would be better. It also didn't do a very good job on the inclination. That was probably more due to the timing of the launch. We were a little bit too late launching the shuttle uh, to uh, make the rendezvous. We should have launched a little bit earlier and that would have reduced how much um, inclination difference there was. 
the station isn't currently at 51.6 degrees, which is where it should be. It's actually at 50, and that was due to where Zarya ended up. It's also a little bit lower than the real ISS is. Uh, the real ISS is at 400 by 400-ish. Uh, this is lower currently. Anyway, we proceed with the Zvezda launch, which is the third module. And of course, this was launched by Proton once again, uh, right at the edge of Proton's capacity. 19 tons here. It's a little bit lighter than Zarya, it turns out. It, it's physically larger, I think. But anyway, nice view of uh, Proton. A somewhat scenic sort of uh, time of day to launch. Clouds as well. Now, the Zarya module launched on November 20th, 1998. And then Unity launched on December 4th, 1998, which was two weeks after, so pretty quick. And then Zvezda, though, Zvezda took a while. There was a huge delay, and Zvezda only launched on July 12th, 2000. So that was a year and seven months, or eight months, after Unity. So quite a long time there. And that probably had something to do with the numbering system for the shuttle being a bit off when it came to... Uh, Endeavor, the Unity module mission was STS-88, and then the next shuttle mission to add something to the station was STS-92. But in between, there were uh, three-digit shuttle missions and uh, I guess it was because the Z1 truss was delayed due to uh, Zvezda not being delivered yet. Yeah, the shuttle missions were always all over the place as far as their numbering anyway. So here we are. Zvezda making rendezvous, but it doesn't have all that much fuel, you'll note, uh, to make all these um, rendezvous burns. And we really can't use the station anymore. It's got less than one meter per second really. It's got enough to turn around. That's about all it can do. So here we go and you can see down to five meters per second here and Zvezda just isn't able to to close the gap. We're within one kilometer but here I'm turning the station. It's not a reaction wheel, it's just a really slow RCS burn. Uh, well, uh, uh, a single RCS burn to try and turn towards it, but it's not going to do any good. So I decided to do an emergency mission using a Progress. So we're going to use the Progress here launched on a Soyuz rocket. Uh, use Progress to tug the Zvezda module into the rest of the station. And this obviously was never done, but if they had this problem with Zvezda, I imagine that this is probably a good solution. Now I'm using an older uh, Progress this time. Uh, this is uh, before this is uh, Progress as it was up to 1990, which means it didn't have solar panels. It had internal electric charge and I think fuel cells, um, but it didn't have solar panels, so it looked different from what you're used to. I uh, in in the lore of this situation, we'll assume that they uh, uh, decide to use. Uh, progress that was in storage and from an earlier model. So there's an earlier model progress. There's a Raider Nick model. Later on we'll be using the proper progresses with the solar panels and everything. The good thing about this is, is it's got a decent amount of capacity for extra fuel. So since it's being used as a tug, it's uh, good for that purpose. Okay, here we are, getting to orbit with it. Uh, still some inclination difference, but at least within one degree. Okay, there we go. Orbit. And awaiting decoupling. Okay, there we go. And progress is away. I could have used Progress's own fuel to complete orbit or something, but uh, I would have had to tell the KOS script about that ahead of time. So rendezvous burns, you can see I've packed in 700 meters per second. That's way more than Progress normally has, but I added the fuel and basically the orbital module, which is usually where they put the supplies that Progress is delivering, um, is currently just filled with fuel. So sort of a different sort of Progress altogether makes sense that they would use an older one to retrofit it like this, maybe? Who knows? So here we are, lining up with Zvezda. And 
and docking. You can see the probe and the drogue on the Zvezda tail, which is where progresses dock. Okay, a little bit of magnetism there. Um, didn't really catch. There we go. Okay, so now with the Zvezda module, it has less delta V, but still enough. We weren't that far away from the station, actually. So a minor burn will do the trick. And there's the station. Still misnamed, unfortunately. It's uh, named after the Unity mission, which was Endeavor with Unity, obviously. So we'll have to fix that, but I still haven't fixed that. Here we go, bringing this stuff together. Nice scenic view, but very patient. It's very hard to maneuver these things sometimes. Let's see, it's a little bit off. It's not that heavy. These are not the heaviest modules I've ever tried to dock together. But the RCS ports aren't always in the ideal place. At least it is better than the situation with the TRS uh, tug. Okay... There we go. All right, Zvezda has been delivered. Progress has done its work. Uh, emergency progress mission. The first actual progress mission to the space station happened a month after Zvezda docked to the space station. So Zvezda docked on July 12th and the first progress arrived on August 6th. Uh, so actually uh, between the docking of Unity on STS-88 and the docking of Zvezda, there were three shuttle missions that arrived at the space station but didn't deliver any new modules. Uh, that was STS-96, STS-101, and STS-106. So they were all missions to fix things up without delivering anything new. Here we see Progress coming back, and Progress does not separate the way Soyuz does. It, it uh, descends intact, so there are no decouplers between the modules. Um, and however I still need to turn down the heat tolerance it looks like I didn't add heat tolerance to this it doesn't have a blader it probably shouldn't be able to descend through the atmosphere like that without dying so I'll probably have to fix that anyway on with the delivery of the Z1 truss and PMA3 to the space station this is STS-92 discovery launching on October 11th 2000 this carrying seven crew and so I put seven Kerbals though I don't have the Kerbals named appropriately for the crew. We decided to try out an in-cockpit view for launch since KOS is in charge anyway though we did uh, get very close sights of eyeballs from the Kerbals. That's interesting. I do wonder about their eyes and whether one eye gets in the way of the view of the other eye ever. They have big eyes. Anyway, just getting the panel set on Rasp Prop Monitor. You can see the horizon there. It is an interesting ride, and uh, the cockpit is not 100% clickable, but it is, at least the multifunction displays are clickable. It would be quite a thing to have a fully clickable space shuttle cockpit and you have to get everything right in order to have it do its stuff. That would be intense. That was SRB separation. Now from what I've heard, when SRBs sept, the crew was able to sort of see flames from the shuttle cockpit, from the separatrons, if you will, the separation boosters. We did not see any of that. Ours were much tamer. Here is the shuttle's roll to have the external tank face downward. It's a little bit jerky because uh, Rasp Prop Monitor and just being in this view adds lag to the whole situation. But it was an interesting thing to uh, experience. Our pilot is calm. Of course, the commander is the actual person who pilots the thing, and the pilot is the co pilot, but. Don't tell the pilots that. Okay, coasting to Apoapsis to do the OMS burn. And here's the OMS burn. 
that makes orbit and again uh, as I said maybe if we could get the initial apoapsis to be a bit higher you'll save on some fuel that would help I'm sure the external tank still has fuel for that okay here we are approaching the station and I decided that we were really tight on fuel you can see we're down to 231 and I'd like to reserve 400 now but that's 400 without the cargo in the bay but still, I, I wasn't too happy with the situation. I decided what we would do is we would dock the shuttle to the station and then try and remove the modules while docked and uh, maybe use Canada Arm, we do have it fitted or maybe use the tug one way or another but this way I would be able to send a refueler up maybe another progress, uh, maybe the next scheduled progress in fact send progress up with some shuttle fuel instead that of course never happened as far as I know but well we, we get to run our space program the way we want to run it so this is tough docking the space the space shuttle wiggles a lot and every every uh, puff of the RCS adds a lot of velocity I'm not using fine controls here um, probably should have but controlling from the docking port is also not very balanced controlling from the cockpit the RCS is much more balanced from there but controlling from the docking port because of the cargo in the back of the bay it's a little bit unbalanced, well okay it's a lot unbalanced and there's a lot of um, extra moment around it rolls, it does bad things so here we are, it seems like we're lined up with the target docking port, that's another PMA there and just trying to convince the docking ports that it's alright. You see, I mean, the shuttle is tilted, you can see that's not proper. We try and fix that. But, of course, if you're trying to fix that and it's still moving, that's not good. So, can't overcorrect. You have to correct just enough. Uh, it's very. And there's a lot of, I'm taking a look at the relative velocity, the relative velocity seems quite high, but it shouldn't be. I mean, it was reading like more than 0.1 meter per second, but it didn't seem like our relative velocity should have been that much. But anyway, we docked, and so, well, what happens next will have to come in a future video. This is as far as I've gotten so far. This was 12 hours of live streaming over two sessions, so, yeah... It's going to be a lot of work getting the ISS together, but I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.